So it's a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome President Barack Obama to Sweden. As you all know, this is a historic event, the first bilateral visit ever by a president of the United States to Sweden. We have had a very constructive meeting. There are many reasons why the relationship between the United States and Sweden is special. Many Swedes emigrated to the United States at the end of the 19th century, and somewhere around four million Americans today claim Swedish heritage. Business ties flourish between our two countries. Sweden is, in fact, one of the largest investors per capita in the US, and we have considerable American investments in Sweden. The United States is the most important foreign employer in our country. Our societies are founded on the same core values, democracy, respect for human rights, and rule of law. All these values are at the heart of the deeds of Raoul Wallenberg. And I'm looking forward to the possibility to pay tribute to Raoul Wallenberg this afternoon, a man who chose not to be indifferent and who saved thousands of Hungarian Jews from the Holocaust. The United States and Sweden also share ambitions when it comes to the opening of global trade flows. Trade has laid the foundation of Sweden's wealth and prosperity. Around 50% of our GDP comes from exports, and Sweden strongly supports open trade regimes, and in particular, a free trade agreement, now being negotiated between the European Union and the United States. This will not only bring more jobs and growth to both our continents, it will also strengthen our political and economic partnership. We also touched upon the economic situation in Europe and in the United States. I mentioned that the crisis has hit countries in Europe differently, Sweden being one of those countries that has done relatively well during the crisis. But the need for structural reforms exists throughout Europe to stay competitive and at the same time preserving all our welfare ambitions. We have also discussed climate change and its consequences. It re represents one of the most important challenges to our societies. Sweden has reduced greenhouse gas emissions by 20% since 1990, while GDP at the same time has increased by 60%. So there is no contradiction between economic growth and the protection of environment. I welcome President Obama's ambitious new climate action plan. U.S. emissions have, in recent years, already fallen substantially. And your new plan will help the United States to make even further reductions. We have agreed to work together in the international climate negotiations to make sure that other countries also are prepared to cut their emissions. This is the only way that we can protect our environment. We have discussed a few foreign policy issues as well, and the most topical, of course, being the situation in Syria. Sweden condemns the use of chemical weapons in Syria in the strongest possible terms. It's a clear violation of international law. Those responsible should be held accountable. Sweden believes that serious matters concerning international peace and security should be handled by the United Nations. But I also understand the potential consequences of letting a violation like this go unanswered. In the long term, I know that we both agree that the situation in Syria needs a political solution. So, thank you once again, Mr. President, for coming to Sweden. I look forward to our program together this afternoon. Please. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hey. <laughs> uh, I've just exhausted my Swedish. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister Reinfeldt, uh, for your very kind words and uh, welcoming me today. Uh, I'm proud to be making the first ever bilateral visit by U.S. President to Sweden. Um, it's only been a short time, uh, but I already want to thank uh, all the people here for uh, the warm hospitality that's been extended to me and to, uh, my delegation. This is truly one of the world's great cities. Uh, it is spectacularly beautiful. Uh, the Prime Minister tells me that uh, the weather is like this year-round. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, so, like so many who have come here, I feel Stockholm in my heart, and uh, I'm sure that I'll want to bring back my family to have a visit uh, sometime in the future. Uh, I've said before that it's no accident that democracies are America's closest partners, uh, and that includes Sweden. That's why I'm here today. Uh, as free peoples, we recognize that democracy is the most effective form of government ever devised for delivering progress and opportunity and prosperity uh, and freedom to people. And as two of the most innovative economies on Earth, we cherish that freedom that allows us to innovate and create, uh, which is why we're leaders in science and research and development, uh, those things that pioneer new industries and broaden uh, our horizons. Uh, we share a belief in the dignity and equality of every human being, uh, that our daughters deserve the same opportunities as our sons, uh, that our uh, gay and lesbian uh, brothers and sisters must be treated equally under the law, uh, that our societies are strengthened and not weakened by diversity. Uh, and we stand up for universal human rights, uh, in, not only in America and in Europe, but beyond, uh, because uh, we believe that when these rights are respected, Nations are more successful, and our world is safer and more just. So I want to thank uh, Sweden and the Swedish people for being such strong partners in pursuit of these values that we share. Uh, the partnership uh, is rooted in deep friendship, uh, but as was also mentioned, we have very strong people-to-people -people ties. My hometown of Chicago has uh, a lot of people from, uh, of, of Swedish descent. Um, Vice President Biden was honored to welcome uh, King Gustav and uh, Queen Sylvia to the United States earlier this year to mark the 375th anniversary of the first Swedish colony in America, and I'm looking forward to visiting with the King and Queen tomorrow. Um, I should mention on behalf of hockey fans uh, back home in Chicago, uh, I have to say how grateful our championship Blackhawks are for their several teammates who hail from Sweden. So that's been an excellent export uh, that we gladly accept. Um, I had a chance to uh, visit with uh, Prime Minister Reinfeldt uh, in the White House during my first year in office, uh, and he has always proved to be a thoughtful uh, and uh, deliberative uh, uh, partner uh, on a whole host of international issues, uh, and I'm pleased that we've been able to strengthen uh, that partnership in our discussions here today. Um, we, of course, discussed the appalling violence being inflicted on the Syrian people by the Assad regime, including the horrific chemical weapons attacks two weeks ago. Uh, I discussed our assessment, which clearly implicates the Syrian government in this outrage. Uh, the Prime Minister and I are in agreement that in the face of such barbarism, uh, the international community cannot be silent, and that failing to respond to this attack would only increase the risk of more attacks. Uh, and that possibility that other countries would use these weapons as well. Uh, I respect, and I've said this to the Prime Minister, uh, the UN process. Uh, obviously, the UN investigation team has done heroic work under very difficult circumstances. Uh, but we believe very strongly, with high confidence, that in fact chemical weapons were used and uh, that uh, Mr. Assad was the source. Uh, and uh, we want to join with the international community uh, in an effective response that deters such use in the future. Uh, so I updated the Prime Minister on our efforts to secure congressional authorization for taking action, as well as our effort to continue to build international support for holding uh, the Assad regime accountable in order to deter these kinds of attacks in the future. And we also discussed our broader strategy. Um, the United States and Sweden are both major donors of humanitarian assistance uh, to the Syrian people. We will continue those efforts. We're going to continue to try to strengthen the capabilities of an, an inclusive, uh, and representative opposition uh, and to support uh, the diplomacy that could bring an end to all the violence and advance uh, a political transition and a future uh, in Syria where all people's rights are upheld. Uh, those are goals that we share and uh, we will keep uh, working towards those goals. And more broadly, given Sweden's close partnership uh, with NATO, uh, we also touched on some of the other security challenges and I expressed uh, my appreciation for the extraordinary work uh, that uh, the Swedish Armed Forces has uh, done uh, in a whole range of issues, including Afghanistan uh, efforts uh, to resolve some of the conflicts uh, in Central Eastern Europe 
and uh, the ongoing training that's also being provided uh, and the good example that's being provided by Swedish Armed Forces here in Europe. Um, mindful of the jobs that are supported by trade between our two countries, we discussed ways to partner more, including uh, creating a clean energy partnership that creates jobs and combats climate change effectively. Uh, Sweden is obviously an extraordinary uh, leader uh, when it comes to tackling climate change and uh, increasing energy efficiency and developing new technologies. Uh, and the goal of achieving a carbon neutral economy is remarkable and uh, Sweden is well on its way. Uh, we deeply respect and admire that and uh, think we can learn from it. Uh, in the United States, we've taken some historic steps, doubling our electricity from wind and solar, uh, improving the fuel efficiency of our cars, uh, reducing our carbon pollution to the lowest levels in nearly 20 years, but we all know we need to do more. So my new climate action plan, more clean energy, more energy efficiency, less emissions, uh, will allow us to do even more uh, in the years to come. And uh, we look forward to a close partnership with Sweden on what is going to be a global challenge. Uh, and at the uh, Royal Institute of Technology today, I look forward to seeing some of the innovative ways that we can cooperate. Uh, we also talked about trade and the tan Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, uh, or TTIP. I want to thank Sweden and the Prime Minister for the strong support of these negotiations, and I believe that for the U.S. and the EU to reach a high standard, comprehensive agreement uh, can create more jobs and opportunity on both sides of the Atlantic. And as I head into the G20, uh, I shared my view that here in Europe and around the world, we've got to stay focused on creating jobs and growth. Uh, that's going to be critically important uh, not only for our economies, but also uh, to maintain stability in uh, many of our democracies that are under severe stress at this point. Uh, and finally, I want to salute Sweden along with all the Nordic countries uh, for uh, your strong support for democracy and development. Uh, strengthening democratic governance in Eastern Europe, global efforts against AIDS, TB, and malaria, uh, responsible development in Africa. Uh, I want to thank uh, in advance the Prime Minister for hosting our meeting tonight with the leaders of all the Nordic countries, and I look forward to our discussion. So uh, to Prime Minister Reinfeldt, thank, thank you for, so much for your hospitality. To the people of Sweden, thank you. Uh, this is uh, a wonderful visit, uh, and I'm looking forward to it producing uh, concrete results uh, that will uh, enhance the lives of uh, both uh, the American people and uh, the people of Sweden. So with that, I think we'll take some questions. Yes, we'll now open the floor for questions. The first question goes to Swedish news agency TT, Tina magnegård -Bjersh. Mr. President, welcome to Sweden. Thank you. Um, as you might know, the NSA surveillance affair has stirred up uh, quite a few angry reactions even here in Sweden. What do you want to say to those upset, and how do you think the affair affects the relationship between our countries? And as a follow-up to that, um, I know that in, at home you are sometimes accused of wanting to turn the U.S. into Sweden. <laughs> now, <laughs> now that you're here, um, you've been here for several hours, uh, what have you seen? What actually inspires you? What do you want to import to the U.S. in terms of ideas for society? Well, uh, uh, let, me, let me take the uh, NSA question first, uh, because this is a question that I've received uh, in previous visits to Europe since uh, the stories broke uh, in The Guardian, and uh, I suspect I'll continue to get uh, as I travel through Europe uh, and around the world for quite some time. Um, like other countries, uh, we have uh, an intelligence operation uh, that tries to improve our understanding of what's happening around the world. Uh, and in light of 9-11, uh, a lot of energy was focused on improving our intelligence when it came to uh, combating terrorism. And uh, what I can say with confidence is that uh, when it comes to our domestic uh, operations, the concerns that people have back home in the United States of America, uh, that we do not surveil 
the American people or persons within the United States, uh, that there are a lot of checks and balances in place designed to avoid a surveillance state. Uh, there have been times where uh, the procedures, because these are human endeavors, uh, have not worked the way they should, and we had to tighten them up. Uh, and I think there are legitimate questions that have been raised about the fact that as technology advances and capabilities grow, it may be that the laws that are currently in place are not sufficient to guard against the dangers of uh, us being able to track so much. Now, when it comes to intelligence gathering internationally, uh, our focus is on counterterrorism, weapons of mass destruction, cybersecurity, uh, you know, core national security interests of the United States. Uh, but what is true is, is that the United States has enormous capabilities when it comes to intelligence. Um, you know, one way to think about it is in the same way that our military capabilities are significantly greater than many other countries. Um, the same is true for our intelligence capabilities. So even though we may have the same goals, our means are significantly greater. Uh, and I can give assurances to the publics in Europe and around the world that we're not going around snooping at people's emails or listening to their phone calls. Uh, what we try to do is to target, very specifically, areas of concern. Having said that, uh, what I've said uh, domestically and uh, what I say to international audiences is with changes in technology, with the growth of our capabilities, um, if, our, if our attitude is because we can do it, we should go ahead and do it, then we may not uh, be uh, you know, addressing some of the legitimate concerns and dangers that exist anytime we're talking about intelligence gathering and surveillance. So uh, what I've asked my national security team to do, as well as uh, independent uh, persons who are well-known lawyers or civil libertarians or privacy experts to do, is to review everything that we're doing with uh, the instructions to them that uh, we have to balance the ends with the means. And just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. Uh, and there may be situations in which we're gathering information just because we can that doesn't uh, help us with our national security, uh, but does raise questions in terms of whether we're tipping over into being too intrusive with respect to uh, the, uh, you know, the interactions of other governments. And that is something that we are currently reviewing carefully. Uh, we are consulting with the EU in this process. We are consulting with other countries in this process uh, and finding out from them what are their areas of specific concern uh, and trying to align what we do uh, in a way that uh, I think alleviates some of the public concerns that people may have. Um, but this is always going to be a, some, uh, there's going to be some balancing that takes place uh, on these issues. Um, you know, some of, some of the folks who've been most greatly offended uh, publicly, uh, we know privately engage in the same activities directed at us or use information that we've obtained to protect their people. Uh, and we recognize that, uh, but I think all of us have to take a very thoughtful approach to this problem. And, and, and I'm the first one to acknowledge that given advances technology and the fact that so much of our information flow today is through the internet, through wireless, uh, that the risks of abuse are greater than they have been uh, in the past. Um, now, with respect to uh, Sweden, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to wander around uh, Stockholm as much as I would like, uh, 
Um, it, it is a gorgeous country. Uh, what I know about uh, Sweden, I think, uh, offers us some, some good lessons. Number one, uh, the work you've done on energy, I think, is something that the United States can and will learn from. Uh, because every country in the world right now uh, has to recognize that if we're going to continue to grow, improve our standard of living, uh, while maintaining a sustainable planet, then we're going to have to change our patterns of energy use. And Sweden, I think, is far ahead of many other countries. Um, Sweden also uh, has been able to have a, a robust uh, market economy while recognizing that there are some investments in education or infrastructure uh, or research that are important. Uh, and there's no contradiction between making public investments and being a firm believer in free markets. Uh, and that's uh, a debate and a discussion that uh, we often have in the United States. Um, you know, I have to say that if I were uh, here in Europe, uh, I'd probably uh, be considered right in the middle, maybe center left, maybe center right, depending on the country. Um, in the United States, sometimes the, uh, the names I'm called are quite different. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, uh, a third observation and final observation I'd make is, is though I know that, uh, I'm sure Frederick doesn't feel this uh, as, as he's engaging in difficult debates uh, here, uh, I, I do get a sense that uh, the politics in Sweden right now um, uh, involve both the ruling party and the opposition engaged in a respectful and rational debate uh, that's based on facts and issues. And um, uh, you know, I think that kind of recognition that people can have political differences, but uh, uh, we're all uh, trying to achieve the same goals, uh, now that's, that's something that uh, Swedes should be proud of and should try to maintain. The first question from the American press goes to Steve Holland of Reuters. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Uh, have you made up your mind uh, whether to take action against Syria, whether or not you have a congressional resolution approved? Uh, is a strike needed in order to preserve your credibility for when you set these sort of red lines? And were you able to enlist the support of the prime minister here for support in Syria? Uh, let me unpack the question. First of all, I didn't set a red line. The world set a red line. The world set a red line when governments representing 98 percent of the world's population said uh, the use of chemical weapons are abhorrent and passed a treaty forbidding their use even when countries are engaged in war. Congress set a red line when it ratified that treaty. Congress set a red line uh, when it indicated that uh, in a uh, piece of uh, legislation titled the Syria Accountability Act that uh, some of the horrendous things that are happening on the ground there uh, need to be answered for. Uh, and so when I said in a press conference that my calculus about what's happening in Syria would be altered by the use of chemical weapons, which the overwhelming uh, consensus of humanity says is wrong. Um, that wasn't something I just kind of made up. I didn't pluck it out of thin air. Uh, there's a reason for it. So that's point number one. Point number two. Uh, my credibility is not on the line. The international community's credibility is on the line. And America and Congress's credibility is on the line because we give lip service to the notion that these international norms are important. And when those videos first broke and you saw images of over 400 
children subjected to gas, everybody expressed outrage. How can this happen in this modern world? Well, uh, it happened because uh, a government chose to deploy these deadly weapons on civilian populations. And so the question is, how credible is the international community when it says this is an international norm that has to be observed? The question is, how credible is Congress when it passes a treaty saying we have to forbid the use of chemical weapons? And uh, I do think that we have to act. Because if we don't, we are effectively saying that even though we may condemn it and issue resolutions and so forth and so on, uh, somebody who is not shamed by resolutions can continue to act with impunity. Uh, and those international norms begin to erode. And other despots uh, and authoritarian regimes can start looking and saying, that's something we can get away with. And that then calls into question other international norms and laws of war, uh, and whether those are going to be enforced. So uh, uh, as I told the Prime Minister, I am very respectful of the UN investigators who went in at great danger uh, to try to gather evidence about what happened. We want more information, not less. Uh, but when I said that I have high confidence that chemical weapons were used and that the Assad government, through their chain of command, ordered their use, uh, that was based on both public sourcing, intercepts, evidence that we feel very confident about, including uh, samples that have been tested showing sarin from individuals who were there. Uh, and I'm very mindful of the fact that uh, around the world, and here in Europe in particular, uh, there are still memories of Iraq and weapons of mass destruction accusations and people being concerned about how accurate this information is. Uh, keep in mind, I'm somebody who opposed the war in Iraq. I am, am not interested in repeating uh, mistakes of us basing decisions on uh, faulty intelligence. But having done a thoroughgoing evaluation of the information that is currently available, I can say with high confidence, chemical weapons were used. And by the way, Iran doesn't deny it. Even Syria doesn't actually deny that they were used, and that is what the UN investigators are supposed to be determining. And frankly, nobody's really disputing that chemical weapons were used. The only uh, remaining dispute is who used them, which is outside the parameters of the UN investigation. So the UN investigation will not be able to answer that preliminarily. They're not supposed to. But what we know is, is that uh, the opposition doesn't have the capability to deliver weapons on this scale. These weapons are in Assad's possession. We have intercepts indicating people in the chain of command, both before and after the attacks, with knowledge of these attacks. We can show that the rockets that delivered these chemical weapons went from areas controlled by Assad into these areas where the opposition uh, was lodged. And the accumulation of evidence uh, gives us high confidence that Assad carried this out. And so the question is, after we've gone through all this, are we going to try to find a reason not to act? And if that's the case, then I think the world community should admit it. Because you can always find a reason not to act. This is a complicated, difficult situation. 
uh, and an initial response will not solve the underlying tragedy of the civil war in Syria. As Frederick mentioned, that will be solved through eventually a political transition. But we can send a very clear, strong message against the prohibition uh, or, or in favor of the prohibition against using uh, chemical weapons. We can change Assad's calculus about using them again. We can degrade his capabilities uh, so that he does not use them again. And so what I'm talking about is an action that is limited in time and in scope, targeted at the specific task of degrading his capabilities and deterring the use of those weapons again. And in the meantime, we will continue to engage the entire inter international community in trying to find a solution uh, to the underlying problems. Which brings me to the last question, uh, and that is, uh, uh, what happens if Congress doesn't approve it? Uh, I believe that Congress will approve it. Uh, I believe Congress will approve it because uh, I think America recognizes that uh, as difficult as it is to take any military action, even one as limited as we're talking about, even one without boots on the ground, uh, that's a sober decision. But I think America also recognizes that um, if the international community fails to maintain certain norms, standards, laws governing how countries interact and how people are treated, uh, that over time this world becomes less safe. It becomes more dangerous not only for those people who are subjected to these horrible crimes, but to all of humanity. And we've seen that happen again and again in our history. And the people of Europe are certainly familiar with what happens when uh, the international community finds excuses not to act. Uh, and I would not have taken this before Congress uh, just as a symbolic gesture. I think it's very important that Congress say uh, that we mean what we say. And I think we will be stronger as a country in our response if the President and Congress does it together. As Commander-in-Chief, I always preserve the right and the responsibility to act on behalf of America's national security. I do not believe that I was required to take this to Congress. But I did not <coughs> take this to Congress just because it's an empty exercise. I think it's important to have Congress's support on it. Okay. And the next Swedish question goes to Swedish national television, Erika Bjerg. Uh, Mr. President, you've given very eloquent talks about the moral force of nonviolence. I was wondering, could you describe the dilemma to be a Nobel Peace Prize winner and getting ready to attack Syria? And also, um, in what way did the talk that you had today with Prime Minister Reinfeldt move the world a step closer to resolving the climate crisis? Um, I would refer you to the speech that I gave uh, when I received the Nobel Prize. Um, and I think I started the speech by saying that uh, compared to previous recipients, uh, I was certainly unworthy. Uh, but what I also described was the challenge that all of us face when we believe in peace, uh, but we confront uh, a world that uh, is full of violence and occasional evil. And the question then becomes, what are our responsibilities? So. I've made every effort to end the war in Iraq, to wind down the war in Afghanistan, uh, to strengthen our commitment to uh, multilateral action, uh, to promote uh, diplomacy as the solution to problems. The question, though, that all of us face, not just me, our citizens face, not just political leaders, is at what point do we say 
we need to confront actions that are violating our common humanity. And I would argue that when I see 400 children subjected to gas, over 1,400 innocent civilians dying senselessly in an environment in which you already have tens of thousands uh, dying, and we have the opportunity to take some action uh, that is meaningful, even if it doesn't solve the entire problem, may at least mitigate this particular problem, uh, then uh, the moral thing to do is not to stand by and do nothing. Um, but uh, it's difficult. This is uh, the part of my job that uh, I, I find uh, most challenging every single day. I would much rather spend my time talking about how to make sure every three and four year old uh, gets a good education than I would spending time thinking about how can I prevent three and four year olds from being subjected to chemical weapons and nerve gas. Unfortunately, that's sometimes the decisions that I'm confronted with as President of the United States. And frankly, as President of the United States, I can't avoid those questions. Because uh, as, mu as much as we are criticized, when bad stuff happens around the world, the first question is, what is the United States going to do about it? That's true on every, every issue. It's true in Libya. It's true in Rwanda. It's true in uh, Sierra Leone. It's now true in Syria. Um, that's part of the deal. Uh, what was the second question? What I, uh, I think we have great opportunities. I think there's a good uh, chance for uh, Frederick to, to talk about uh, uh, our shared views here, because uh, we have, uh, I think, a, a joint belief that developed countries have to make progress, but we have to have an international framework to address where the increases in emissions are now occurring. Okay, well, I totally agree to that. Um, I think it's been a very interesting developing development after Copenhagen. Uh, I learned, uh, we were both present in Copenhagen, that we were saying that U.S. had the highest emissions in the world and that China was catching up. Um, now, only a few years later, we have a situation where China is now double the emissions of the ones we have in U.S. Uh, this is actually reshaping the situation when it comes to climate protection. Uh, we are both responsible for lowering our emissions, and we are doing so. But what we, uh, we must also face the fact that we very soon have a situation where 25% of the global emissions is from European Union and United States together. So the world can't say, solve it, pointing at a quarter. They need to take in the 75% outside of European Union and United States. That is our problem. We want to deal with this, but it has to be a global answer. The final question goes to Margaret Talev of Bloomberg News. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, tomorrow you'll see President Putin at the G20 uh, with Russia and U.S. relations seriously strained. Do you see value in trying to persuade him still to drop opposition to a Syrian strike? Um, or are, you, are your efforts now aimed at excluding Russia from the decision? And looking back at your hopes for a reset, um, do you believe that you overestimated what you could change, or do you believe that Mr. Putin changed the rules midway? If you will indulge me, I have one more. Uh, but it's all related. I, um, I will indulge you. <laughs> Thank you. To let um, you ask, ask the question, I may not answer it, but go ahead. Could you take us behind the scenes uh, on that 45-minute walk around the South Lawn where you changed your mind and decided to take this before Congress? And Mr. Prime Minister. Oh, goodness. Margaret, you're really pressing things now. <laughs> so this is question number four now. No, this is for the Prime Minister. I see. Um, uh, you have expressed some doubts about military action in Syria, and I'm wondering if you could be a little bit more specific about what you're concerned the consequences may be, and whether you believe that uh, President Putin uh, has any bear of the uh, sh shares any burden of the responsibility for Mr. Assad's actions. Thank you. Okay. I, I mean, I'm just I'm going to try to remember all this. Uh, <laughs> 
first of all, uh, the, the reset in the Russian relationship uh, was not uh, done on a whim. There were specific U.S. interests that uh, I believed we could pursue with Russia where interests overlapped uh, that would help us both on our long-term national security and our economy. And we succeeded. We succeeded in passing uh, a new START treaty that reduced uh, nuclear stockpiles for both the United States uh, and Russia. Uh, Russia joined the WTO, which bound them to a set of international rules governing trade, uh, which I think ultimately will be good for the Russian economy, uh, but is also good for its trading partners and uh, potential companies that are investing in, in Russia, and that includes U.S. companies. Uh, you know, we work together on counterterrorism issues. Uh, they have provided us uh, significant assistance in supplying our, our troops in Afghanistan. Uh, there were a whole host of uh, outcomes from that reset that were valuable to the United States. Now, there's no doubt that, as I indicated uh, a while back, we've kind of hit a wall in terms of additional progress. Um, but uh, I have not written off the idea that the United States and Russia are going to continue to have uh, common interests, even as we have some very profound differences on some other issues. And where our interests overlap, uh, we should pursue common action. Where we've got differences, we should be candid about them, uh, try to manage those differences, but not sugarcoat them. Uh, one area where we've got a significant difference right now is the situation in Syria. Um, Russia has a long-standing relationship with the Assad regime. Um, and as a consequence, uh, it has been very difficult to get Russia working through the Security Council to, uh, to acknowledge uh, the, some of the terrible behavior of the Assad regime and to try to push towards the kind of political uh, transition that's needed in order to stabilize um, Syria. And I've said to Mr. Putin directly, and I continue to believe, uh, that even if you have great concerns about elements in the opposition, and we've got some concerns about certain elements of the opposition, like al-Nusra. Uh, and even if you're concerned about the territorial integrity of Syria, and we're concerned about the territorial integrity of Syria, if you, in fact, want to end the violence and slaughter inside of Syria, then you're going to have to have a political transition, because it is not possible for Mr. Assad to regain legitimacy in a country where he's killed tens of thousands of his own people. That will not happen. Uh, so far, at least, Mr. Putin has rejected that logic. Uh, as far as security action, uh, uh, Security Council action, we have gone repeatedly to the Security Council for even the most modest of resolutions, condemning some of the actions that have taken place there. And it has been resisted by Russia. Uh, and do I hold out hope that uh, Mr. Putin may change his position uh, on some of these issues? Uh, I'm always hopeful, uh, and I will continue to engage him, uh, because I think that uh, international action would be much more effective, and ultimately we can end deaths much more rapidly if Russia uh, takes a different approach to these problems. Um, in terms of my decision to, to, to take uh, the issue to Congress, um, this, this had been brewing in my mind for a while. Um, some people had noted, and I think this is true, that had I been in the Senate in the midst of uh, this period, uh, I probably would have suggested to a Democratic or a Republican president that Congress should have uh, the ability to weigh in uh, on uh, an issue like this that is not 
uh, immediate, imminent, uh, uh, time sensitive. When uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mr. Dempsey, indicated to me that um, whether we struck today, tomorrow, or a month from now, uh, we could still do so effectively, uh, then I think that raised the question of uh, uh, why not ask Congress to debate this in a serious way. Uh, because I do think it, it raises issues that are going to occur for us and for the international community for many years to come. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that under international law, Security Council resolution uh, or self-defense or defense of an ally provides a clear basis for action. But increasingly what we're going to be confronted with are situations like Syria, like Kosovo, like Rwanda, in which we may not always have uh, a Security Council that can act. It may be paralyzed for a whole host of reasons. And yet we've got all these international norms that we're interested in upholding. We may not be directly, imminently threatened by what's taking place in a Kosovo or a Syria or a Rwanda in the short term, but our long-term national security will be impacted in a profound way and our humanity is impacted in a profound way. And so I think it's important for us to get out of the habit in those circumstances, again, I'm not talking about circumstances where our national security is directly impacted, we've been attacked, et cetera, where the President has to act quickly. But in, in circumstances of the type that I describe, it's important for us to get out of the habit of just saying, well, we'll let the President kind of stretch the boundaries of his authority as, as far as, uh, as he can. Congress will sit on the sidelines, snipe. If it works, the sniping will be a little less. If it doesn't, a little more. But either way, the American people and their representatives are not fully invested uh, in what are tough choices. And we as a country and the world are going to start having to take tough choices. Uh, I do get frustrated, although I'm under, you know, I understand how complex this is. And anytime you're involving military action, then people will ask, well, this may do more harm than good. I understand those arguments. I wrestle with them every day. But I, I, I do have to ask people, well, if in fact you're outraged by the slaughter of innocent people, what are you doing about it? And if the answer is, well, we should engage diplomatically, well, we've engaged diplomatically. The answer is, well, we should uh, shine the spotlight and, and shame these governments. Well, these governments oftentimes show no shame. Um, well, we should act internationally. Well, sometimes because of the various alignments, it's hard to act through a Security Council resolution. And so either we resign ourselves to saying there's nothing we can do about it and we'll just shake our heads and go about our business, or we make decisions even when they're difficult. And I think this is an example of where we need to take, make decisions even though they're difficult, and I think uh, it's important for Congress to be involved in that decision. I think, I think, um, I, think, um, I, think I think, I think, I think I should answer the question. I think uh, you're right in saying that this is very difficult decision to take. And as always, it's a balancing act. And we've been discussing this during our talks. Just to remind you, you're now in Sweden, um, a small country uh, with a deep belief in the United Nations. You're also in a country where I think yesterday or the day before, we took the decision that all the people that are now coming from the war in Syria are allowed to stay permanently in Sweden. So a lot of the people following this press conference here in Sweden are actually just now coming from Syria and of course wondering what is the view of their country. And they have a lot of their countrymen also in this country. So we have a lot of roots and links to Syria. Um, I think the main problem has been for two and a half years now that we have a war without a clear political solution. And that at the end of the day must be, we must get a ceasefire, we must get a peace process 
we must get uh, people to talk to each other. Um, I, I totally understand the, the complex situation also on the opposition, because we have part of the opposition also here in Sweden, which is now conducted of different groups. They want to get Assad out of the picture, but what do they want instead? That is, of course, a question we need to attend to. The uh, weapons inspector that was present in Damascus is headed by a Swede. So in this country, of course, we are asking for the time to be able to see what were their findings, especially since President Obama has sent the decision also to Congress. Uh, we think that that gives us some more time, and we are welcoming that. Having said that, I also said that I understand the uh, absolute uh, problem of not having a reaction to use of chemical weapons and what kind of signal that sends to the world in a time where we are developing our view on international law, not saying that you're allowed to do whatever you like to your own uh, people uh, along, as long as, as it's inside your own borders. No, we have, we have this, uh, uh, we need to protect people. We need to look at the interest of each and every one. So this, this is the development we are seeing. That's the same discussion we are having in Sweden. So I, need, I understand, especially um, for the US president, he needs to react, otherwise he will get another kind of discussion. But this small country will always say, let's put our hope into the United Nations, let us push on some more to get a better situation. Of course President Putin has a responsibility in that, of course, because everyone understands that Russia and also China has been outside of decision-making that we would have needed a long time ago to put more clear pressure and more political solution. So that is, that is what we have been discussing today. If you balance all these sentences, that shows how difficult this is. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you thank very you. much. That concludes this press conference. Thank you all for attending.